Okay, so we're going we're gonna to look at Romans 8 today, Life in the Spirit, as we've been going through the book of Romans. I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. This is part one of Life in the Spirit. The word of our Lord, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of his sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And Father, as we look at your word over the course of these next few weeks, we see Lord God, we see here the answer to the struggles we have. The struggles we have, Lord, with sin, the world, and the devil. The defeats that we experience, Lord God. When we read the scriptures, we see that you have called us to a life of victory. Victory, Lord God, over the enemy. and Victory over the world. And victory, Lord God, over our own sinful nature. And many of us, Lord God, we don't know how to obtain victory. But in Romans 8, Lord God, we get the answer. To walk in the Spirit. So, Father, I pray that you would just, Lord, teach us. Be our teacher. Lord, I pray that I would disappear behind the cross and and people would see you, Lord Jesus, right in front of them, teaching them, Lord God, through your Spirit this next few weeks. And that, Lord God, there would be many victories won here. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So to understand this, let me say this to you. Before I, I dig into the text, I want to say four keys to understanding our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And I want to stress this. Four keys to understanding our relationship. In fact, say relationship with me. Look at the person next to you and say relationship to them. Look at the person behind you. Okay, those are in the back. You're going to say the wall. Say relationship because it is a relationship that is being spoken about here with the Holy Spirit. Four four keys to understanding our relationship with the Holy Spirit. First key, He is the Spirit of Christ. Want to know what He's like? Look at Jesus. Want to know what the Father's like? Look at who? Jesus. Okay? He is the Spirit of Christ. In Romans 8, 9, right? The Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of the Messiah. The Meshach. He is the Spirit of Yeshua. Now, there are two extremes you will find in the church. And you go to a church, you're going to find one of these two extremes and very few that are really in the place in the middle. One extreme is that you have churches where the church professes to believe in the supernatural power of God. But yet if you were to talk to people about the leading of the Spirit, telling them that you're led by the Spirit, you're being guided by the Spirit, or, or you're, you're quoting from Acts chapter 2, which, which is basically Peter quoting from the book of Joel, that you had a dream that you felt was a dream of the Spirit, or a vision of the Spirit. You'd start talking that way in a lot of very conservative fundamentalist church. They think you have five heads, right? They claim to believe in the supernatural power of God, but they live like secular humanists. Now, the other extreme is that the Spirit, uh, basically, they have all of these ecstatic, incredible experiences, supposedly, but they cannot be confirmed in Scripture. So they're having these experiences, but they're not scriptural experiences. So you have a lot of emotionalism. And, you know, God told me this, and, you know, and God, and God told me that. And when I went out, when I went out and I started preaching in different churches, the Holy Spirit, I just want to say, there was a point where I had an intimidation or fear about the Holy Spirit. And I'm in churches where a lot of the things that were being done that were supposedly of the Spirit were weird, uh, strange. 
And I began to question, where's that in the Bible? I don't know if you do that, but I do that all the time. Where, where, where is that, in, where's that in, in the Bible? And, you know, people, people are, you know, I'm in, I'm in churches where people are falling over. By the way, you know, the whole slaying in the spirit, where that in the Bible? And people say, oh, well, it was when Jesus was being arrested. And they said, um, is Jesus here? And he said, I am he. And they all fell over. Those were his enemies. Where is that? You know, where is that in the Bible? They tap somebody on the head and they fall over. Where is it in the scriptures? And I can't find it. Are people rolling over? People vomiting? I could tell, I could tell you stuff. Let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something here. About the weird stuff. But I had a woman one time come and tell me, she told Sue and I this, that in her church, the Spirit was moving so powerfully. I want to be, listen to this. I really prayed about saying this to you this morning. I want to show you how weird this gets. That the Spirit was moving so powerfully in her church that people were having orgasms during the service. That's the Spirit? And she was, she was just absolutely certain that it was the Holy Spirit. So, so I mean, it, you, start, you start experiencing things like that. You start to, you know, you, you, you become a little, a little afraid of the Holy Spirit. Grew up in the Catholic Church. What did they call the Holy Spirit, right? Pre-Vatican II? He was the Holy Ghost. And you have a three-year-old kid hearing about the Holy Ghost? And I was afraid of ghostesses. <laughs> Just to understand again, he is the Spirit of Christ. The same nature and essence of Yeshua. The, the same love that, hey, John could put his head upon the chest of Jesus. That's the same nature of that, that loving compassion of Jesus. Jesus took the little children and placed them on his lap. Same love and compassion of the Spirit that Jesus had for the children, so the Spirit has. The same compassion that Jesus had for the multitude who were hungry, Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit has. The same patience, the same kindness, the same goodness, the same rebuke. That he gave to Peter a number of times, the Spirit has for us when we're not walking right. The same challenge that Jesus had for Thomas, right? Thomas, you don't believe? Here's my hands, here's my side. The same challenge the Lord gives to us. The same challenge, the same tears that Jesus wept over Jerusalem and over the tomb of Lazarus, so the Holy Spirit has for those who are resisting him. He speaks the same words. He loves. He loves the same way. He is the Spirit of Christ. And that should warm our hearts to want to know him better. Want to have a, a deeper relationship with him. Okay, second key. He is the Spirit of the new birth. In Genesis 1.1 it says, And God created the heavens and the earth. Well, the Spirit... He is the one who creates in us spiritual life. He is the one who brings our spirit from death to life. That's what the whole idea of the new birth is. Let me read to you from John chapter 3, 5 through 8. Jesus answered Nicodemus, and he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The winds blow where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone born of the spirit. He is the one who comes and, and gives us spiritual life. You know, people, you ever have people here say this? Well, you, you're one of those born again Christians. Well, according to Jesus, you can't be a Christian unless you're born again. Most of the time when people say that, they're saying that because you're so alive with the Lord and they're dead. They're dead in their dead church and there's no spiritual life and you're alive in the life. Like people said that to me. Well, you know, I've been, I've, been, I've been a Christian since I was born and I was baptized, but you must be one of those born again Christians. <laughs> And I immediately take my Bible out and show them in John chapter 3. You can't be a Christian unless you're born again, unless you're born of the Spirit. 
And he is the spirit who gives us that life. He, he creates new life in us, right? I was dead. I was dead to God. I didn't care about God. Didn't care about his word. Didn't believe in God. Didn't believe that his son was the Messiah or the Savior. Didn't believe that the Bible was the word of God. And when that wind blew through my soul, that, 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 you know, that January night, I suddenly became alive to God, alive to his word, alive to his will. He brings life from death. Third, the third key of the Spirit is a person. Not a force. He's not the Schwartz. Right? The Schwartz be with you. It's not like Star Wars, right? Yoda, you know, it, the force, the force, the force, right? It's not, it's not, he's not a force. He's a person. He's a unique person. The Father is a person. The Son is a person. The Spirit is a person. Don't think of a person in the sense of having a head and hands and feet and a body. The idea is persona. Persona. He's a, he, he's a unique personality. The third person of the Godhead. Watch what, watch what the Lord said. And by the way, you, you talk to Jehovah Witnesses, you talk to Mormons, these people who deny that the Holy Spirit is a person. Just, just take, them, take them here to John chapter 16, 13 to 15. And by the way, you can use it in the New World Translation, their own Bible. Yes. However, notice this. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take up what is mine and declare it to you. All things of the, uh, that are of the Father are, uh, has, are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. He, he. How many times did he say he? Ten times. Okay, that's a personal pronoun. He is not a It. Jesus is not saying it, it. He's saying he. And when you go through the scriptures, you see that the Holy Spirit has, has all of the attributes and characteristics of persona. He has a will. He makes decisions. He has intellect. Actually, it says in, in 1 Corinthians 2, he knows all things. He can be grieved. He has emotions. He is, he is a person, a person that we, again, we can know and we can experience. Not an it. You don't, you don't call a person an it. Okay, unless you're really angry at them, right? And then you're wrong anyway. I, I know the only time we give a name, a personal name to something that is, is not a persona is when men have boats, right? They call the boat after a woman, right? Right? Hey, my, my, yeah, my, come, come on down the Hudson River and I'll take you out on my boat, Clara, you know? I mean, it's a... Other than that, we don't do that. And Jesus here is making it clear the Holy Spirit is a person. The fourth key is walking in the Spirit. And that is the key to understanding victory in the Christian life. Walking in the Spirit. If you will walk in the Spirit, you will have victory over the flesh, you will have victory over the world, you'll have victory over the devil. We fight on three battlefronts. I was teaching this on Wednesday night, right? We fight against the enemy, the devil. We fight against the world, and that's the system of the world under the devil's power. And we fight right, against the very uh, sinful nature within us. And the key to victory is to walk in the Spirit. I just want to say this to you. That, is, that should be a major focus in your life. To walk in the Spirit. You familiar with uh, John 15? Right? The parable of the, uh, the vine and the branches? To abide in the vine is to walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit is to abide in the vine. Okay? It's, it's the same thing. And it's where you will have victory. You're getting defeated by the enemy. You're getting defeated by the world. You're getting defeated by the flesh. It is because you are not walking in the Spirit. When you're walking in the Spirit, you will have victory, right? It tells us in Galatians 5.16, walk in the Spirit and you will not uh, fulfill the lust of the flesh. That, that, that's the key. So let's start off our first point. Again, just, just talking about, again, the Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit of Yeshua. He comes to give us new life. He is a person, and we are called to walk with Him. Walk in Him. So the first thing is, is, is walk. So in, in, in walking, okay, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore there is no, con now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
So there, 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 is no, there is no condemnation, okay? And in other words, let me, let me show you. If you are walking in the Spirit, you are going to be getting a continuous confirmation from the Spirit that you're saved. When you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to get a continuous... The Spirit's just going to be continuously confirming in you that you're saved, uh, that you're His, that you're loved, that you're forgiven, that He's with you, that you're secure... That's gonna, you're going to just continuously be getting that from the Spirit of God when you're walking in the Spirit. Now, now in Romans chapter 8, 14 through 16, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, by the way, the leading of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, I believe, are the same thing. Everyone who is led by the Spirit, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, I want you to notice there, there is a beautiful interaction here when you're walking in the Spirit. When you're walking in the Spirit, the Spirit, again, is confirming to you, you are mine, and I am yours. And you're, the Spirit is moving inside of you where you're crying out, Abba, Father. Abba, Abba is to say, Daddy, in the Hebrew. You have this close, intimate, rich, relationship with your Father in heaven and your heart through the inspiration of the Spirit is crying out, Abba. And then the Spirit of God is then confirming to you, you're my child. You're a child of God. You belong to me. That is, that is the, the, the assurance of, of salvation. Again, that, that beautiful interaction, that, that, that flow of the Spirit in us and us then responding in the Spirit back to God that happens when we are walking uh, in the Spirit. If you are walking in the flesh, and listen to this, I'm talking about a believer who's in Christ, but you're walking in the flesh. You ever walk in the flesh as a believer? Anyone? Am I the only one who's ever done that? Boy, you guys are so spiritual. I'm like way out of my league here. I'm way out. You should be teaching today. I should be sitting. By the way, uh, pastors are not um, more spiritual than the people, many people in their country. I hope you understand that. That there are many people here who I look to who are far more spiritual than me. I think my wife is an example. I think my wife has surpassed me in her spirituality. God has just given me a gift to teach and preach. Okay, I try to live the life. I try to walk the life. But I, there are people here. I can look at some of you and you're, you're you know, more spiritual than me. But the, 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 the concept, again, the, the, the concept here is when you're walking in the Spirit, you'll have that beautiful interaction happening. When you're not walking in the Spirit, that voice that you are mine fades. That, that awareness of His love for you becomes foggy. It becomes weak. And, and anybody who's walking in the flesh, you know that's true. I'm talking to you here about this rich flow of, of crying out, Abba, Father, I love you. And the Father then is, is, is coming to you and speaking to you through Jesus and the Spirit that you're mine. You're my child. And if you're walking in the flesh, you're like, man, I, I'm not getting that. That's, that's exactly what the Word is saying. This entire chapter, Romans 8, it begins and is filled with and ends with this key concept. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit. In, in the first verse, again, no condemnation. And if you go to the last two verses, let me just, let me just read this to you, because it's really saying the same thing. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Why can nothing separate us from, Christ Jesus, from, the, from the love of Christ Jesus, right? The love of the Father that has come to us through Christ. Why can nothing separate us from that? Why? That's right, because there's no condemnation. Because <laughs> you've been forgiven by, the, by the, the death of Jesus and the resurrection. You, you have been redeemed. You have been justified. You are regenerated. There's no condemnation. So nothing can separate us from that love. Now watch. I'm going to go back now to, to Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. 
So I want to ask you this question. What is the law of the spirit of life in Christ? Now, we know what the law of sin and death is. How do we know what the law of sin and death is? Because if you were here last week, you understand Romans 7 was all about the law of sin and death. Remember the law? The moral law. It could be the Ten Commandments, or it's just the moral law that hits our hearts when we have lied, when we have gossiped, when we have slandered, when we have stole something, right? When we have blasphemed the name of the Lord, when we have something in front of the Lord, and the law hits the heart. What does it bring? Condemnation. It brings guilt. You suddenly realize you're, you know, you're a sinner. That's what happened to you before you were born again. You got convicted. I realized I was a sinner and I needed a savior. That's the law of sin and death. It brings death. It brings condemnation. Now, what is the law of the spirit of life in Christ? What do you think that is? A law. I thought we were free from the law, but there is a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You know what I think that's a re reference to? And I think that, okay, what's the best way to understand scripture? Yeah, it's better, it's better than going on the internet and trying to get opinions from people. I, I just want to stress that to you. So all these people, like, even in our church, where they use books, I have to use a book for my Bible study. Why don't you use this book? Hey, we're using this book from this author. Hey, you know what? You got 66 of them right here. Most of my time is in this book. Well, I like this. I like this author. He's got some good things to say. Man, what about Paul? Peter, Jude, Moses, David. Are, are we so out of tune with the Holy Spirit and his word that we have to just continuously rely on, on, on reading those, those other books? And again, there's a place for that. But I just think, get into the word. So Romans 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. If you look at chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, watch this. He says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. I want you to notice, sending his own son, those four words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him, they would not perish but have eternal life. I believe that this is simply talking about the gospel. The law of the spirit is the gospel. It's the good news. It's, it's salvation, right? It's by grace through faith that you could have all your sins forgiven. You could have all your sins blocked out if you'll come and put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The, the, life, the, the, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ is the gospel of Jesus. The Lamb has died. The sacrifice has been made. You need to receive Him into your life. And that, that is the key to receiving and experiencing the freedom from condemnation in Christ. Now... Again, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk in the Spirit. As you walk in the Spirit, again, you have this continuous confirmation of God that you're His. So here's a question for you. How do you walk in the Spirit? I think you'll get a lot of, a lot of strange answers on that. And I want to, I want to share, I'll share with you a, 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 few, a few simple thoughts. I think walking in the Spirit, you will experience the law of the Spirit of life. You'll experience that assurance of there being no condemnation. But what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Here's one. To walk in the Spirit means to be led by the Spirit. Right? It, tells, it tells us that right here. To be led by the Spirit. John chapter 16, 13. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. To walk in the Spirit is, is to be led by the Spirit. There's a lot of stuff in our culture, right, about being led by Spirit guides. You even see stuff in the Christian aisle, in Barnes and Noble, that has to do with nothing with Christianity and with the New Age movement. But people are looking for Spirit guides. They're, they're looking for angel guides. Hey, how about being led by the one and only true Holy Spirit? The, the, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Yahweh. To be led by the Spirit. And let me say this to you. 
To be led by the Spirit is a very daring life. You got you to have guts to be led by the Spirit. And my experience is most people in the church prefer to be led by a person, an earthly person, than the heavenly Holy Spirit. And most people in the church would rather be led by a bunch of rules and regulations and have themselves put under the law than be led by the Holy Spirit. That's my experience. They want, they want all kinds of boundaries and laws set up instead of truly coming in to a deep relationship with God through the Holy Spirit and being led by Him. Why do you think I'm always pulling down signs in the church? I anger all the ministry leaders here. I've been ripping down signs for, for 30 years in this church. Put up, the people put up signs. You've got to wash the dishes. If you don't know that you're supposed to wash the dishes after you use them, there's something wrong with you. Don't do this. Clean up after you go to the bathroom. Come on. We're people of God. If we're led by the Spirit, you're going to know that. We don't need a bunch of rules and regulations. We, we don't need the Bible with, with a bunch of additional books that are, that are telling us what, you know, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what we should do. Remember during the, the, the promise keepers, right? They had the ten promise keepers of God, promises of God. I just wondered, what about the Ten Commandments? Wasn't, isn't that enough? Do we need to add on another ten? Just to, to be led by the Spirit is to be led by the Spirit within. Him guiding you, Him prompting you, Him leading you. Now that could be, right, could be a little scary. Because sometimes we mistake our emotions for the Spirit. Sometimes people have come to me and said, Oh, Pastor, usually this happens with a lot of visitors. Oh, Pastor, the Holy Spirit told me. In fact, we had a lady one time here and she comes to me on a Wednesday night and she says, The Holy Spirit told me that, that you should become a part of the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> Nuts. Oh, pastor, the Holy Spirit told us that um, your son was going to marry our daughter. Right, Frank? <laughs> Remember one time, we, when Frank, he was a little boy, this woman comes in the church, she goes, oh, the Holy Spirit told me that I'm going to become like, like a, a second mother to him. My wife was like, what? <laughs> the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with it. And I'll tell you something, we've got to be careful with that. Because our emotions, our emotions can lead us astray. So one of the key things in being led by the Spirit is always test everything. By what? Scripture. By Scripture. By Scripture. <coughs> test, put all things to the test in Scripture. So to be walking in the Spirit means to be led by the Spirit. Secondly here, it means to obey the Spirit. To be walking in the Spirit means to obey the Spirit. The Spirit will direct you, the Spirit will prompt you. Look, look, this is a great, great verse. In Acts chapter 2, 29-30, Philip, one of the seven deacons, is being moved by God to do his work, and there's this Ethiopian eunuch sitting on his chariot. The Ethiopian eunuch, he's a leader of Ethiopia. He's, he's reading the Bible on his, cha uh, on his chariot. He's reading the book of Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Isn't that cool? Go and overtake it. Like, go there and make yourself known. So what did Philip do? Philip procrastinated. He said, should I go? Maybe no. Maybe, no, no, he said, I'll pray about it. You ever see people like that? The Holy Spirit is saying to do something? No, I'm going to pray about it. When the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you don't pray about it. My goodness. People procrastinate. Oh, I have to go bury my father. Hey, he's been dead for a year. He's dead. I can't bury him again. Remember Jesus, all the excuses people give? When the Holy Spirit is directing you to do something, you do it. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? That's it. You just, you, you, you do it. If you don't do it, okay, you resist, you start playing games with the Holy Spirit, what is he going to do to you? He's going to start disciplining you. He'll start disciplining you. Things start going wrong. Marriage, finances, career, ministry, things start going wrong. When you're not, when you're not listening. I mean, he makes it clear. 
So last week, on the camera, if you can follow me, if you can't, um, just I disappeared and was raptured on the uh, message. I'm just sitting here. And um, my daughter was going up doing the announcements, and, and she was talking about Pastor Lou is leading a, a mission trip this summer, and they want people to donate $50. And uh, so the Holy Spirit just put on my heart, give $50. That was it. So I wrote out my check for $50, and I gave it to the, um, to the trip. Didn't debate about it. I didn't need to pray about it. Just did it. And when the Holy Spirit asks you to do something, you just, and that's just something, I'm like, I know many of you, you, you know, you do that. It's no big deal. But it's just when he tells you to do something, you do it. And, and when you're doing that, okay, what you're going to find is going to put you right in that place where you're walking with him. Now, now watch. When you are led by the Spirit of God and you're obeying the Spirit of God, what results is it means you're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to become extremely fruitful. He's leading you, you're obeying him, and right, you just, fruit begins to manifest in your life. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now watch this. Here's a test for you. Want to test to see if you're walking in the Spirit? Love. You got hate. You got bitterness, you got unforgiveness, it's a surefire sign you're not walking in the Spirit. Joy. You got misery in your life, you're joyless, you're, you're irritable, you're irritated, that's a surefire sign you're not walking in the Spirit. Peace. You got chaos and confusion in your life, it's a sign you're not walking in the Spirit. Faithfulness. You're in a place where you're unfaithful. It's a surefire sign you're not walking in the Spirit. Self-control. You're out of control. You're losing control. It's a surefire sign that you're not walking in the Spirit. It's that simple. The fruit of the Spirit is always going to manifest in a life of a person who's walking in the Spirit. So walk. Right? That's the word here, walk. Now, second thing. Choose. Because you have a choice every day, over and over and over again, to walk in the Spirit or to walk in the flesh. You have a choice to be led by the Spirit or be led by the flesh. Now some people have this concept that when we come to Jesus, we become robots. Right? When Jesus comes into your life, the Holy Spirit fills you, what's going to happen is he's just going to take control and you're just going to, he's going to tell you, go this way. No, turn around. No, go this way. And he's just going to direct you. In the, that's not how it works. Don't we wish, Faith, that that was the way it worked? I do. Lord, just like re re remove my free will. Boy, would that be good and easy. Instead, he's given you a free will and you must make decisions. Shall I walk in the Spirit? Shall I walk in the flesh? Now look at Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. There's your choice. What are you going to focus your mind on? What are you going to think about? The purposes of your life. The priorities of your life. Where is your mind going to be fixed? On the Spirit around the flesh. And that's your choice. The choice here is, will you set your mind on the spirit? Will you set your mind on the flesh? It's about focus. If you focus on the flesh, that's a self-life. That's a life of selfishness. That's me, 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 my. You know what? Hey, I lived like that for a long time. I wanted to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. Me, me. It had to be me. It had to be, it had to be my way. You ever see little people like that in the church? It's not. I'm not getting what I want. So I'm going to go around. I'm going to gossip to other people. That, that They're not giving me what I want. They're brats. They're spiritual brats. I have to have it my way. It's, it's my way. It's my way or the highway. Go, the highway is there. Don't let the door hit you in the butt when you're on the, going out. 
You have a choice. You can focus on the flesh or you can focus on the spirit. To focus on the spirit is to focus on the Lord, on his will, on his way, his son, his word, his work. Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 5, beautiful passage. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Notice this verse 4, it says, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice that. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the interests of others. Look, we all look out for our own interests. I look out for my own interests. My, my relationship with God is very important. My, my wife, my, my children, my grandchildren, they're, they're very important to me. Finances, uh, my career, I look out for those things. But he says that we not only should look out for our own interests, but we should look out for the interests of others. We should be concerned about others. We should be praying for others. We should be looking to, to help others. Do you carry people in your heart? Or is it just consumed with you and your, you know, your little life? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a funny story. So, um, the day of your wedding, and it was a heck of a weekend for me. A heck of a weekend for you. So my mom had double surgery uh, the day be uh, before Good Friday. Then we had the service for Jeannie Monnier. And then we had Good Friday service. And we had your wedding. And Kamel, he scared the, the heck out of us all. And um, I ran up to the hospital and was up there. I come back to the wedding. My knee is like, like pain level eight. So I come to the wedding and I'm sitting there. And Ma Maria Peluso is sitting next to me. And I said, Maria, where's Miguel? And she goes, oh, um, Miguel, he's had to go do something. And, and she said, um, could you pray? And I'm like, there's noise, the music is playing, and people are talking, and I'm just not, I'm not zoomed, I'm, I'm just not zoomed in here. So she says to me, um, oh, he's got a rash, and there are some lumps. And she looks at me and she says, we're worried it could be cancer. And I was like, oh, the Plusos I don't think are here this morning, are they? No. So I was like, oh. And for two weeks, like I'm just, I'm, I'm praying, like praying. I'm carrying Miguel in my heart. I carry other people in my heart. And I'm just like, I'm just like crying out to God. This man, beautiful man of God, beautiful wife, beautiful kids. You, you, Lord, you've got to heal him. So um, Miguel doesn't say anything to me. I see him a few times. I figure, you know, some people sometimes are private. I just think his wife told me, and, and I understand that. By the way, I'll tell you this. If, if, if you've got a problem, pray. I mean, I just want you guys, you guys can pray for me as much as you want. You can spend all day fasting and praying 24-7 for me. I'll accept that, okay? I really believe in it. So on Wednesday night, Miguel's sitting there, and I come in and sit next to him, and I said, Miguel, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. I said, what's going on with your, your skin? He goes... My skin is fine. I said, you don't got lumps on your skin? He goes, he goes, no. He goes, I'm okay. I said, no concern about cancer? He goes, oh, that's my dog. <laughs> she was telling me about her dog, not Miguel. So when I told him, he laughed, and he goes, I'm going to go home and tell Maria that. They must have had a great laugh. So I wasted all that prayer and fasting. I, 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 I. God's going to use it somewhere, right? You know, b before I was a believer, I'd have a little concern for somebody like that, but I pretty much would have forgotten it probably about 10 minutes after they told me that. And that's just the difference of, of having the Spirit of God in you. But it's about thinking. It's about what we focus on. Focus on not just your own interests, but others. It, it says in, in Proverbs 3, uh, 23 through 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Our thoughts that are going on in our heart really are a reflection of who we truly are and what we truly are. And God always looks at the heart. Because right? you could fake it outwardly. Let me tell you, it's easy to fake the Christian life. 
You know, you act all spiritual when you're around people and when you're alone, forget it. Like, you know, the devil, you know, you're, you're hanging out with the devil. So I want to I just share, I want to share this, a few quick things with you here on this point. Blessings of focusing on the Spirit. Okay, the Scripture gives us a number of blessings. So one of them is life, right here. Focusing on the Spirit is life, focusing on the flesh is, is death. In, in verse 8 through 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Life, life, the life of God. To be carnally minded is, is death. It's a death. It's a death style. See people living a death style? I see people all the time around me living a death style. This is a lifestyle. And it's also peace. It's, it's shalom. And again, the contrast is not only between life and death, but peace and death. And shalom is more than just, hey man, I'm at peace. Everything is copacetic. You ever hear the word copacetic? If you haven't, you learned it today. It means everything is calm. Everything is serene. And that's, that's not really what shalom means. Shalom means peace with God. It also means peace with yourself. It also means the ability to live at peace with your fellow man. And it's blessing over your marriage. Blessing over your family. Blessing over your children. Blessing over your grandchildren. Blessing over your career. That's what shalom means. It means like a wellness and well-being over your whole entire life. Isaiah 26, 3 through 4, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you, trust in the Lord forever. I'll tell you something, I have found that verse to be 100% true. That if I'm experiencing any, start, uh, any kind of angst, all I need to do is just immediately focus on the Lord and instantaneously there's a peace that happens. Instantaneously. I can be in any situation. I can be walking out of a stressful situation. I just focus on the Lord and there's peace. Peace. Instantaneously. I don't have to fake it. it. This is not positive thinking. This is not me saying, I have peace. I have peace. I have peace. I have. It's not affirmations. It's something supernatural. You know what it's like? You're standing outside and it's freezing. And you say to yourself... I'm warm, I'm warm, I'm warm. You're not, you're cold. <laughs> but to fix your mind on the Lord, it's like walking into a sauna that's 160, 210 degrees. You walk in there, and it's like, bang, you feel the heat. It's supernatural. So when we're focusing on the Lord, there's life and there's peace. And the third one here, it's pleasing to God. I mean, we want to live pleasing to God, don't we? If we're in Christ, we want to please God. And sometimes we don't. But we want to live a life that's, that's pleasing to Him. Romans chapter 8, uh, verse, uh, here again, 7, uh, verse 8. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the Spirit obviously can please God. The mind that's focused on the Lord will, will be pleasing to God. I just want you to uh, say this to you. If you're in Christ, God loves you. Okay, you have a special relationship with God. But if you're in Christ, you can still be in the flesh. So God loves you no matter what. But when you're in the flesh, that might not be pleasing to God. So it's almost like a, a parent with a child. You love your kids. You love your kids unconditionally. No matter what they do, you love them. But when they're not living up to their potential, when, when they're acting out, right, it's not pleasing to you. But yet you still love them. So the, the idea here is that God loves you, you're in Christ, but when you're walking in the flesh, you're not pleasing Him. When we walk in the Spirit, we're pleasing Him. I don't know about you, that, that's a desire I have. I want to be pleasing to Him. He gave me it all. He gave me His best. I want to be pleasing to Him. Last thing here, third point, enjoy. So walking in the Spirit again, right, it's, it is a choice. And... Um, I believe it is a life to be enjoyed. We're not under the law anymore. Westminster Catechism, one of the famous catechisms says, this is a man's purpose to glorify and enjoy God. Just make that, how about that as a purpose for life? To glorify and enjoy God. How many of you are enjoying God in your life? Right? You should be enjoying Him. Romans 8, verse 8, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. But we have the Spirit of Christ. 
And we're free from condemnation. And we're free from the penalty of sin. And we're free from the power of sin. And we are loved. And we are forgiven. And we are justified. We should be in a place where we are enjoying getting to know that God who gave us his all and just enjoying the relationship with him every day. He's working in you and the work he started in you, he will finish. And he will conform you to the image of his son. We'll look at that in upcoming chapters. In Romans 8.10 it says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. That's kind of the bad news, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. You know what that means, the body is dead? We're in decay, right? Every, every one of us, this thing, right? No matter how many vitamins you take, no matter how many workouts you do, it's in decay, Right? We're, 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 it's dying. Look at um, 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing. Right? It's perishing. It's decaying. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Hey, isn't that great? You ever see people? Getting old is horrible. Getting old is terrible. It doesn't need to be. Though this thing may be breaking down, Inside, it, it, you're growing in Christ. The spirit, the spirit is, is, is getting bigger. The spirit is getting better. But we're in a state of degeneration. You don't need to be discouraged and depressed. I'm not depressed that I can't bench press 400 pounds anymore and squat 600 pounds. I'm not depressed about that. I'm not, I'm not depressed that I'm, I'm not running marathons anymore. We're doing triathlons anymore. I'm not, I'm not depressed about that. Right? Where the doctor says to me, you have, um, you have receding cartilage in your hip. I, I looked at him and what receding. Let, let me just show you this. This is me. That's really me. Bob, you remember that guy, right? That's me at like 20 years old. Rolling waves. Rolling waves have become sandy beaches. Let me tell you, you've got to learn to laugh at yourself. So the, the doctor's saying to me, you've got receding cartilage in your hip. I said, I went to the dentist last week. I got receding gums. I got a receding hairline. Everything is receding. That's what it's saying. When a baby is born, 100% stem cell, right? This is just everything that makes for growth. By 18 years old, it's 40%, 30 years old, it's 25%, 60 years old, it's 5%. If you're at 70, you just got a few of them left in you. <laughs> Do you know you start degenerating at 24 years old? You start losing cells in your entire body at 24. So if you're not 24 yet, hey, live it up and enjoy it because after 24, it's straight downhill. And we come into the world looking like that and that's the way we go out. But enjoy your spirit life. And look at what it says in Romans 8.11 and I'll wrap up here. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You know what that's saying? Look, one day this body, unless the rapture happens, okay, we're going to die. Right, I tell people we're going to die. You're going to get cremated. You're going to get buried. Right? They have a nice little ceremony here at the church. Hopefully you have a lot of nice things said about you. Hopefully. Right, then we go into the rock center. We eat potato salad. We talk about what a great person you were. Eat enchiladas right? if you're from Mexico. Quesadillas. Lasagna if you're Italian. Right? If Gerard's doing it, right, you got soul food coming in. Right? But one day, one day, see when you die, your soul goes to be with the Lord. You're conscious, you're aware, you're, you are who you are. You'll know your friends, you'll know your family members, you'll know Jesus. You're going to be in glory. But your body is going to go into the earth. When the Lord returns and you have the great resurrection, the body will be brought to life and become like his glorified body and be united to, the soul, to your soul. And you will live with the Lord in glory forever and ever. Body, soul, spirit. Right? That is the resurrection. She said, hey, look, it may be wasting away, but I, I'm getting a new suit one day. 
Man, and, and look, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be in better shape when I'm glorified than when I was when I won bodybuilding championships. So I have something to really look forward to. But for now, my soul, my spirit is being renewed every day. And that's the key. So I'm going to wrap up the service today. Uh, we're going to do communion here, so I'm going to invite those who are serving communion. Please make your way up, and just make your way up as I'm talking. But you have, you have really today in hearing this message, right, you hear about you know, walking in spirit, and you have to make the choice. You have to make the choice to walk in the spirit. Or you could walk in the flesh. But to walk in the spirit is life. To walk in the spirit is peace. And to walk in the spirit is to please God. And, and that is the, the choice that you have. And I want to say, let's use the Lord's Supper as a, as a means. We talked about consecration this past Wednesday. Just look at it as a, as a means of giving yourself to God, surrendering to Him, saying, Lord, I, I want to be filled with Your Spirit and I want to walk in Your Spirit. And just ask God as we go through the communion service to just give you a fresh, a fresh anointing of His Spirit. Spirit came at Pentecost. And then a couple chapters later, he came again. And then he came in Samaria. And then he came upon Cornelius and his family. And then in chapter 19, he came upon Ephesus. We, we need to be continuously filled with the Spirit of God. To be renewed by the Spirit of God. Welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise.
your name is just the greatest name filled with so much power so much grace so much mercy you seek us out and you save the lost Lord. 